He rubs against your legs, purring loudly. Large, sapphire eyes gazing up at you. Love is in the air. Until he lunges at the only exposed skin on your ankles. As unpredictable as your cat may be, you want a cat litter you can count on. World's best cat litter is the hard-working, odor-destroying litter with no harmful chemicals or clay dust. And because it's made from corn, it's natural and sustainable. Try World's Best Cat Litter for the world's best cat. WQE 99.1 FM, The Key, home of Southern Sports and Talk, Noonan, Sharpsburg, Franklin. Cars will break down, and when they do, it's too late. If your car is out of warranty, it leaves you with two choices. Get stuck paying for expensive repairs or one phone call to CarShield. Their administrators pay for your covered repairs so you don't have to. Your coverage includes roadside assistance, towing, rental, and so much more. Plus, with their nationwide network, you choose the mechanic or dealer. Best of all, there's coverage for every wallet size. Make the smart call before it's too late. Call CarShield today. Hey, Coach Prime. I think you got what it takes to wear the Aflac. It's style, charisma, and a smile that's 21 out of 10. Aflac. You know Aflac can help keep unexpected health care costs from ruining someone's finances. Check out this coverage. You still got Aflac. it, Coach. You still got it. Aflac. I never lost it. Yeah. Aflac. You see that coverage? With that wingspan, I see why you got more rings than a cell phone. There's always room for one more. Yeah. Get help with expenses health insurance doesn't cover at Aflac.com. The House of Light brings clarity to your soul, offering a safe space for healing through our compassionate practitioners, services, classes, and wisdom, plus the tools to support you in our retail space. Are you looking for guidance and direction? Stop on by the House of Light Tuesdays from 12 to 3 and have tea and tarot with Christy. The House of Light is located at 29 Jackson Street in Noonan, Georgia. Call 470-414-6711 for more information. My name is Dr. Tony Fauci here at the National Institutes of Health. If you've recovered from COVID-19, your plasma has antibodies that may help others fight COVID. Please donate plasma now. You can literally save lives. There are thousands of locations across the country where you can donate. Find the site to donate your plasma at coronavirus.gov. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense. The views and opinions of this show and program are not the views and opinions of this station, its management, or its clientele. Welcome into Health, Happiness, and Harmony Hour with Dr. Louis Boynton. Your session has been booked. It's now time for you to tune in here and get positive vibes, great information, and much more. Here is your host, Dr. Lewis Boynton. Wow, wake up call. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Lewis Boynton. Thanks for joining us here at Health, Happiness, and Harmony, a show in which we talk about positive psychology, health psychology. We talk a lot about health, happiness, and harmony, and I've been doing it for so long. I'm actually researching and writing a paper trying to build narratives related to health, happiness, and harmony in a clinical setting to create a more uh, prevention-focused environment and therapy to help people get over things, but also to build new, this is what we do in psychology, we build new mental structures so you can help yourself get out of problems sooner. Most therapists should be working to help you build the skills in your life, counselors, therapists, social workers, clinical psychologists, to get to a place where you are ready to live your life on your own. And then, if you like coming to therapy, come back and talk and work things out and, and find it as a process 
to get through life till you build these structures in which you make your own decisions and then you go on and live your life. Martin Seligman a long time ago um, in several lectures and one of his TED Talks, he talks about there are 11 mental health issues that are actually curable. You know, they are issues in which we can overcome and go beyond and, and go into remission. And I know it feels like a lot of people are talking about mental health and wow, we have a lot of problems with mental health in the society in general. It's, it's, it's solvable problem. It's a solvable problem. We need more shows out there talking to people about things with professionals who actually do the work and work with people, not necessarily just write books and teach classes. N nothing wrong with that. They need to be out there too, but we need more experts who are actually doing the work, which they're so busy doing their work right now, it's hard for them to get out and about. Fortunately for me, um, I put my office really close to a radio station, so it's really cool. Um, <laughs> literally, like, what was it, like a one-minute walk from... Yeah. If I have any radio emergencies, like I really need to come on the air, I can just run down the block and go, all right, everybody, I got in a radio emergency. I got to come on the air. <laughs> Maybe one day we can be in the same building together. One day we will, yeah, we'll, we'll have that happen with a nice little production room too. So we can do production and then have it live streamed while we do the shows. That would be the be the next phase of well, this. We're live streaming right now too. I mean, video live stream. Oh, video, add video. Yeah. Video live stream would be cool. Get that done, Doc. <laughs> we can do it. I got the EPQ at the office right now, so we got to work on that one. But I, today I really was thinking about this. Psychology Today has been actually reading my mind. And I don't know how the editors read my mind from that far away, but maybe, maybe it's just like, you know, like Carl Jung believed there's a collective on consciousness. He believed that all of us are unique, uniquely connected somehow as humans to this underlying conscious reality of meaning. He, he called it the collective unconscious. He said humans have, all have similar things. And he got that from all of our origin stories, our mythology, or he called these things archetypes. Archetypes are the characters you usually see in the movies. You ever notice, like, there's, like, an old wizardy guy in a lot of movies, like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and stuff? There's an old, there's, like, a, a, a tough leader, you know, like in all the Avenger movies. There's an honest dude. There's a dude with courage. There's a dude who fights for justice. And then there's John Cena. <laughs> yeah. And then there's anti-heroes that are the opposite of that stuff but the archetype the trickster like loki you know thor's brother he's he the trickster runs through thousands of cultures in their origins you know in in hindu it's uh krishna is the trickster you know in uh in christianity the devil is the trickster you know because he's pretty tricky and pretty evil so I mean, this is, so in this, in this psychology today, the cover today is the power of hope. And I think this is what helps us to survive in times when they're tough for all of us is hope. And as a matter of fact, if you have depression and you feel hopeless, that is a very dangerous place to be. It's because I, I, I know this because I've met lots of people who have uh, tried to take their own life. It's, it's a... It's a very hard decision for most people to make and work themselves up. It does not happen quite often. Very, very rarely it happens instantly. But when it's instant, it's usually an impulse control problem also related to somebody being intoxicated. That, that happens. And that's usually like not a planned thing. But there are people who have depression that's so severe that they cannot feel anything. They cannot hope for anything. When you lose hope, it's it's pretty much a critical place in life when you don't hope for things to get better when you don't hope for your future to change life becomes very very difficult and that's why we need to talk about hope more there used to be a campaign a long time ago 
For those of you who remember when Jesse Jackson ran for president in, what was it, 72? 72, I think. I was a little pup. Keep hope alive. <laughs> that was his slogan. Keep hope alive. And he would say that over and over for a long time. But the truth is, keeping hope alive is what keeps a lot of people alive thinking. And now, according to this article here, hope gives you a better life if you have hope in it. People who have hope have better mental health, live better lives, and live, it, live longer lives. That's remarkable. If you want the cure for longevity in life, Find hope in the world. Treat yourself good. Sleep. Drink water. Take vitamins. Eat well. There's even another article on the Mediterranean diet, which is a whole other show, but we'll talk about that some other time. We'll talk a little bit about food on one show, probably when I get back from Savannah after eating a bunch of good food. But this article is called How to Cultivate Hope. The secret is focusing on what you can control. Now, we've talked a little bit about this, probably maybe 75 times, but <laughs> let's say we're going to talk about it again. You have control over your life. I'm going to say that you have control over the way you see the world. You have control over how much you hate. You have control over how long you hate. You have control over how mad you are, how sad you are, how you do at certain points you do have control the problem is is sometimes it's so overwhelming and so difficult like with trauma it's recorded in parts of your brain it's recorded in cells in your body it's recorded all over the place it's really hard to feel like you can do something about that because especially with like post-traumatic stuff that you've been living with for a long time because it comes on and you have nothing to hold it back that's because you've been under so much duress that you've eliminated the structures or you've weakened the circuitry in your brain. As far as neuroscience would say, you've weakened the multimodal brain systems so that you've created a, a gap in your networking. You've created a frail connection to the neurons that, uh, that establish and give you hope. And this is true when you live with anxiety because when you live with anxiety, you pretty much wear your body out. So it makes it harder to have control, but it doesn't mean you can't get control back. Human beings have this great thing. It's called homeostasis. Homeostasis is an actual physical thing within our body where our body tries to heal itself and balance the whole system of organisms so we can function as a person, physically. There's another... And this also impacts our mental health and well-being. If you're not functioning physically properly, it's much harder to muster, let me tell you that, even if you, you know, try really hard to muster all the things that you need to be, do, and have as a human working towards their potential. That was a big statement, but... So, the idea here is to realize that if you are without hope, if you have a hard time mustering out the energy to live, if you have a hard time finding good things, things to be grateful for on any given day, it means you need to practice and maybe you need to get some help. Now, help by help, I mean you need help either, like I point people in multiple directions because, you know, counseling is great. Counseling is an awesome thing to do, but it also, if you go into counseling, they'll say, hey, you need support, because you can't just come once, one hour every couple of weeks or one hour every week for a little while and figure everything out in life. You need to build a new life that strengthens you, and that helps you to create these new, we call them structures or mental health, mental wellness structures. Now, they're not actually like structures, like like you don't have these little brain cell neuron guys in construction suits building and scaffolding inside your head. No, it's not like that. Although that would be a really cool meditation to do, to create a better brain. You know, you try to rebuild your brain through imagery, you know, meditative imagery is pretty cool. But 
really what it is is we have the power through this process of homostasis and, and allostasis, which is literally the effort to bring us to balance. Allostasis is a neurological process in which our cells themselves, each cell, each neuron, each whatever, can, can repair and, and rebuild itself. It's amazing what we can do as humans. It's amazing what we can do to destroy ourselves. Because I've seen people do things that most people would not think that humans would do to themselves. And that's because their system is broken down. They have a physical malady that has caused them to, to not function normally. Now, to, the only way to determine this is over time and through uh, medical and psychological help. But if you don't know that and you are struggling and you're not getting help right now, go and get some help. Find somebody you can connect with. And say, when you go in, you say, look, you know, having trouble finding any kind of hope in my life. I'm having trouble finding and cultivating hope. In this article, this, this psychologist has come up with some steps. He said the secret is focusing on what you can control and you can cultivate hope. And, and the first thing he says, set and achieve goals. It's number one on the list. Quite often we don't do that. See, I'm noticing a lot of people, generationally I do it myself, I overcommit to goals that I can never achieve. You know? Overcommit to goals I can never achieve. And therefore I feel like I have to give up because I'm never gonna achieve my goals. And when I was when I was a young person, I had this happen to me quite a bit. Um, because I would set these goals that were overly ambitious and I wouldn't put in the things in between. I'd be like, well, you know, I'm a cook now and I'm really good at cooking and I'm working with these really great cooks and I'm working in a four-star restaurant. I'm going to be the best chef in the world. And then after a week, my boss would make me mad and I quit my job and go, I'm never going to be the best chef in the world. Why bother? You know, so it I didn't have the things in place. To be the best chef in the world, you've got to train in other countries. Sorry, America. We used to be number one. We were really great at our food industry, but now because of COVID and everything, you know, other countries are opening up culinary arts schools and other countries are paying more attention to the, the actual artistry of being a chef, like a chef. You got to know a lot of stuff, believe it or not. It's just not frying an egg in a pan. It's knowing stuff about sauces, recipes from all over the place, how to make sauces. It's a little bit of chemistry and a lot of really great timing and preparation and, and strategy. And when I became a cook, I became a prep cook at a banquet place. It taught me how to organize my day, write a list of everything I need to be done get all the supplies, hand out requests for people to help out, and then get the job done. And if we didn't get the job done, we'd get in big trouble because people would pay a lot of money. And guess what? They wouldn't get to eat if we didn't get our job done. Or we'd be scrambling and running all day long. Because when you cook for 600 people at a time, you really got to be organized and planned, especially if you're giving them one plate at a time, you know? or a multi-course meal. It's really an intense thing, but it, it was that thing that taught me how to set short-term goals and meet them, like daily goals. I need to do this day, 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 day. So okay at that, but not great. But when you want to set and achieve goals, you want to make sure you set achievable, measurable, easy goals for yourself. If you want to lose weight, eat less today, drink more water. Get yourself on a diet program that you like, that you don't feel is like punishment, but you feel is something you could incorporate into your life. Create a habit. Set goals that are realistic, not unhealthy. Right? Set goals that help you feel hope, confidence. Things in your life that make you feel good about what you're doing. A long time ago, I set a goal to start presenting papers in other countries. This summer, I'm going to present a paper literally on health, happiness, and harmony 
at a narrative psychology conference in another country. This has been going on for a couple of years now. Finally, by changing my lifestyle, by working a lot for a little bit, and then taking time to write and hang out with cool people who are really smart, um, I set those goals, met those goals, and I'm achieving those goals, and it's something that I've been working on for a really long time. The hard part is I need to be a better writer, so I'm working on becoming a better writer. So He said, goal setting is not only important as the action you take towards achieving something. Wait, wait, I lost something. Oh, towards achieving your goal. People high in hope do both. They achieve and they, ho they hope for something and then they get to it because they believe that they're going to make it. That's the hard part. If you, if you set a goal that you really don't want to make or think, or you set a goal for somebody else, sorry, but people in a lot of relationships sometimes they get, you know, like in a rut and they're like, we're going to change our relationship and make it stronger. But the work that makes a relationship stronger has to be done. So you have to set a goal that you can achieve, something that you hope is going to do. If you're already feeling like your relationship is difficult and impossible, it's really hard to have hope that it's going to be salvageable. So you've got to get the hope first, and you've got to try and set some goals that you think are going to be. Those high in hope surround themselves with positive people. Wow. I know there's this term out there called toxic positivity where people are just like, I don't like the word because toxic is used too much. It used to be toxic sludge, and it was a good thing because you get dipped in it and you become like a superhero, right? Remember that? It would be like a lot of heroes would, like the tick. The tick got dipped in toxic sludge and became a superhero. Same with, oh, Joker was a hero. Nah, Joker was a bad guy. They're, same with. He's a hero of song. <laughs> True, the Joker is a hero to some. Um, but people would fall into or get radiated or, you know, Spider-Man bit by the, the radiated toxic spider. But that's how toxic, now it's toxic masculinity. I, there's not a toxic femininity, but there's toxic positivity. Um, there's toxic this, toxic... Uh, there's all kind of words that are used. And toxic positivity is really just making people feel bad because they're not positive. Um, we used to call that, uh, they used to have a skit on Saturday Night Live with this girl named Debbie Downer. And she was like the one who was like always down and always had a bad comment to say and that kind of thing. It would be like taking Debbie Downer and forcing her to be happy. Or people who actually are so... Like he says it in this, you have to have a little bit of a cognitive dissonance to have hope, but but you also have to have a little focus on the real world to to s sustain hope, because you can't just believe everything's okay while your house is on fire. You know what I mean? While your life's falling apart, <gasps> it's okay that I drink a quart of Jack Daniels a day because I'm feeling pretty good by the end of the night. And you know. If I put a little Coke in it, I get a little sustenance, so I don't really need to eat. And life is so good when I have my Jack Daniels. It's great. Uh, it's, that's that's not that's kind of cognitive dissonance and a little bit of denial. And those are the things we have to watch for, you know, with positivity and positive people. But you know positive people because guess what? Most of the time, if you meet positive people, they're like, they got something good going on. Sometimes you can see it, sometimes it's good. Some, some people just like keeping a positive atmosphere, focusing on the solution, not the problem. Too, too often, because humans have this brain, we're designed to survive, right? We're designed to overcome and anticipate risky situations. And when we did our show on emotions, we talked about the automated process that emotions react. Remember, humans are emotional people. It's like, don't you talk to me like that. I'm never talking to you again. You just shut up and get away from me. And then you go, wow, I was really wrong. Man, I was really mad. I guess I didn't eat my Wheaties when I got up this morning, but I'm sorry. 
we have two types of thinking. First, we respond emotionally. Like, we're going to have two senior citizens running for president again. <laughs> like, every American's going, what? I thought we put those guys in homes and stuff at that age. <laughs> but they're running for president. Oh, wow. What are my choices? No, we're just letting them think that. <laughs> You can't remember? Well, here's your new home. No. Uh, <laughs> um, <Here's the warehouse>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, didn't want to really get political, but I'm just joking. It's a joke. This is what all comedians do. They go, you know, I really love the world and I love everybody, but this is a joke, so don't blow up my Twitter account, okay? And I'm going to tell the joke now. That's what they're all doing on Netflix. It's really hilarious. It's very funny. Um. Positive people are the people you know who are like doing things. Maybe they exercise. Maybe they eat well. Maybe they, they don't have a lot of terrible habits. Maybe they have some. Positive people are looking for the good things, looking on the solutions. Positive people can be sad, but they can say, you know what? Sorrow, sorrow and sadness are part of life. Suffering is a part of life. I wouldn't. Toxic positivity says, no, you got cancer and you're feeling down. No, nope, no. Nope. Keep a smile on your face. You should be happy and glad you're breathing right in this minute. Now let's put a smile on and get out of this oncology office and you got six weeks to live. Bye. No, it's not. That's where you're shaming people because they don't have an energy or belief that you have. That's not the way to positivity is a, is a feeling. It's a practice. I call it flourishing from the work of Aristotle. Sounds really fancy, but he wrote some intense stuff in 300 BC. And over and over and over, when we rediscover his work, it's really that nobody's really read it all. So, because it's hard to read, you got to sit with it for a while. Same with some other philosophers. I, I have a book that I keep to remind me of the year I spent trying to understand it. It's called Being in Nothingness, written by Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning, Nobel Prize winning author, although he rejected the prize because he thought it would make his writing bad. Can you believe that? I can't believe that. But that's when people had some kind of integrity. He said, look, I don't want your stinking Nobel Prize for writing. Although it means I'm the best author in the world. I want to be better. So you could take your little thing and your million dollar thing and stick it. Okay? Or the soul, no <laughs> he did that. He's the only person to ever refused the, the literature prize from Nobel. It's just incredible. But That's cool. That made me like him more. Communists did sit ins, protested at the university, protested the French colonization of Libya. But, but I digress. Positive people are looking on solutions. Positive people stay in a, in a good space. And positive people are not positive all the time. It's hard to be positive all the time. When you have loss and you're grieving, they're built. We do these things for a reason. There's more and more interest in the field of artificial intelligence. We really haven't figured out intelligence intelligence yet. So, I mean, we're so scared about artificial intelligence, probably because we think we figured out something we really didn't figure out yet. That's why. So, remember, we got to work on finding out how we get intelligence intelligence. Because potentially, the human mind is a great untapped resource to make effort and changes in our planet and our world to help us to find things and build societies in which we all can have hope. Ooh, where'd that come from? Um, but hanging out with positive people will help you because you can see how people overcome and go through life finding positive avenues. Positive, positive kinds of things to say. I have a friend who basically just kind of hangs out around her farm, got big farm rides, all this kind of stuff. But she's always posting these cool things about her day. Like, great day, look at this beautiful flower, look at the color purple, writes little posts like that. I just turned to be, I just eat all vegetarians, look at this great meal, here's another great meal, hey, hey, hey. 
does that on uh, Facebook, I think that's really great because, you know, uh, what kind of comment are you going to make? Man, you should have a crappy day. Or, <laughs> my day sucks. I don't like your day. That could be happening, but it doesn't. People are just like, wow, cool. Appreciate that. Thanks. I appreciate that you see the beauty on your own place nearby. Positive people see the beauty in the world. They see the kindness in people. They see that equality among humans. They see that the world can change and get better. We need more positive people because positive people show us that it's possible to even be positive. Because, you know, in this world, we can, I could give a list of things that are wrong. It's harder to focus on the right things and believe that they're going to happen and be possible. It's, it's even harder to try to stimulate or create an interest in positive change. Now, that's a really tough one to swallow, right? How are we going to have positive change with all the things going on? We got whatever. We got spa satellites. We got Chinese balloons. We got stuff in the water. We got stuff in the air. The atmosphere is this and the moon landing was fake, and we got lizards running the government, and we got all this stuff going on, and what the heck? And my phone just keeps hitting me with notification after notification after notification after notification of stuff that may or may not be true, but it sounds kind of like what I believe already, so maybe it is true, and oh my God, is that true? Wait, let me look at my news feed and see how many people commented. Wow, three million people commented on that. Yeah. That must be true. Wow, what a world we live in, man. Used to be, if I want to find out something's true, I go get a book, go to the library. Library? What is that? It's what, in ancient buildings? It's a building with computers and books. That's an ancient building. And you got to read to enter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I leave most of us out. <laughs> the reason why... It helps us to, to look, look up things on our own is because it also can challenge us to, sh to push us to reshape our views in order, to, in, in, in order to overcome some of your most horrible negative cognitive functioning. You've got to first establish that it's there. Guess what, folks? We all have stereotypes. Everybody has a little bit of hate in them. Everybody gets angry. It's you and how you deal with it. It's you and how you hold it. It's you and how you process it. If you have hope and you're with positive people, it's easier to process things. It's easier to get through things. And you don't want toxic positive. You don't want Susie Sunshine making you feel bad. You're like, God, every time I hang out with Susie, she's just so sparkly happy. It just makes me like, Wah. <laughs> yeah, Blah. And you're like, wow, that doesn't seem real or possible. Oh, Lord. Maybe, maybe, maybe those people are, do, are really happy and, and that's good and all. But, you know, you got to find what you fit with. You want to find people who are positive, who help inspire you. Inspire you, you know. The South, when I first moved here from New York, freaked me out. <laughs> because people were so nice. But I didn't know about bless my heart and all those little common sayings that are just kind of like bless your heart it's a dig wrapped in a compliment wrapped in a metaphor you know what I mean basically like yeah bless you buddy because you're going to need it uh, <laughs> and what's that funny accent why are you coming down here from that place we don't like you here um, <laughs> you cost, you cost in our town mate money these northerners, man, with them ideas, big old fancy cars. <laughs> I used to say, hey, hey, man, I grew up in Hawaii. I'm an islander before I'm a northerner, man. But, I, you know, I hung out in New York. It was cool. I hang out in the South. Hot land is cool. It's very hip, hipsterish. When I moved down here, Buckhead was hip, man. It was comparable to some cool places in New York. That's true. It used to be hopping, man. Back in the 90s, Hotlanta was really hot, man. Big, big things going on. With the Olympics coming, there was buzz all over town. We changed Stewart Avenue to Metropolitan Avenue, <laughs> classing up the joint. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody remembers that shift, but that was a really funny shift for people who live in Atlanta. 
especially for those of us who are in the restaurant industry. But sticking with positive people, building hope in your life, setting goals and achieving goals, these are all great things to do. Another thing is focus on what's going on now in your life. I did this when I got sick and I got really, 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 really down. I would focus on the future too much and miss a lot of things in my life. And fortunately for me, my fantastic child would always bring me back to what's now. Because the young kids, kids don't think about the future. They think about what do I do now? I want to play. I got to go to the park. I want a dog. I want to walk the dog. I want to play with the dog. I want to go to grandma's. I want to go this. I want to do that. I want to get ice cream. I want to go here. I want to go here. <laughs> but if you, if you hang out with kids enough, they keep you in the present. So you can actually build a practice of staying where you are in the moment. It's the most important times with your children. It's the times you think about when they're grown. Are the times when you were there with them. I remember teaching my daughter how to tie shoelaces. It was, whoa, a struggle. Dude, she did not. She wanted slip-ons. She actually convinced my wife to get her those, you know, those things with the Velcro-y things. And I was like, no, 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 we got to teach her how to tie her shoes. But the moment, that moment where she learned and did it herself, when she came to me with her shoes tied, when she showed me she could do it, when she recited the little whatever bunny rabbit goes through the thing and through the hill and all that stuff, I've forgotten it now because my daughter's just turned 25, but remembering that and being there with her, remembering uh, her graduation, um, her master's graduation, because she she graduated college with her bachelor's during COVID, but going to her master's ceremony with everybody was pretty, I was very proud of that. I, I went, I was so extremely proud watching her graduate and get her master's in economics. Being there for that, being there, even though I had somewhere else to be, immediately following that, it was really incredible the day that I had for that. But being there and witnessing that and being present for that is incredible. Being present for the birth of my daughter. Being present for her life in general. So I guess what I'm saying is when you're in the moment, we know that it's healthy for you. When you can stay where you are, when you realize for the next minute or five minutes, everything's okay. For the next minute or, f or whatever, I have everything I need in life. I have all the money I could ever spend in the second. I have all the breath I need in my lungs. I have all the food that I could ever eat. In this moment, everything is okay. And the miracle of life is moments when you can do that, life feels safe. You belong. You have things in your life that you can actually keep and hold in your memory. Some of your favorite memories, if you go back through your memory file, are probably times when you really paid attention to what was going on, when you were really embedded in it. I remember when I was a young kid, I played football. I was a second stringer, so basically like I was like a big old tackle dummy. Back then, we used, school was a little bit uh, underfunded, so we used a lot of people to practice drills. So we always had an, a second squad, but... I remember being put into the games when I could. I remember how I felt remembering all the practices and the plays. I remember how I felt going in through and doing these things. And it was, a, it was an incredible feeling to be part of an effort and to actually win. In, in sports, that was the feeling that I used to get. Um, when I was coming up in sports, we competed as children as well. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It was, it was fun for us. Winning and losing, we always shook each other's hands. We always hang out together. Teams would have oranges together. I played soccer in Hawaii, so we were always in a beautiful place. So it's very hard to be happy with 80 degrees sunshine, beautiful palm trees. And for fun, we're going to go to the beach and swim after we play this game. Those are the memories that I like hold, you know, I, I hold on to those sometimes. Those present things can also be recalled. Um, I've been doing a lot of work uh, trying to develop music interventions and playing and searching different music. 
And I find music can generate that, that, that call or it can generate this feeling of being very present to your emotions right in the moment. Um, it's a great way to collect data on how you're feeling is the songs you're playing and what you're doing. It's a great way to process emotions. Like when you're listening to music and sound, sometimes your memory will be triggered because you're, you're, you're funneling everything through your thalamus, which is basically the regulator. It, it, it absorbs everything. It reduces everything to make sense. And then it sort of fires off the circuits. Is it a threat, non-threat, threat, non-threat, threat, non-threat, threat, non-threat? Non In milliseconds, it sends stuff out. It's incredible. We experience it all as one motion. We don't have any breaks in time that we are aware of. It feels like it's all going on now. It's an incredible way to live if you can be in the present. Hopeful people are grateful for what they have. This is an old Buddhist philo philosophical statement. The goal to get you to enlightenment, the, the way to reach enlightenment first, first step is to learn how to live and love and be and enjoy what you have now. Buddhist monks, when they start practicing the religion, they commit to giving up everything. Their only possession usually is a rice bowl and maybe some of their mala beads, which are meditation beads. And their robes that they wear while they're doing their meditative practices. They get food by trusting that others will feed them. For centuries this has been going on. They focus on the life they have. Hopeful people are grateful for what they have. Gratitude keeps them appreciated and grounded in the moment. This happens to Martin Heidegger called this being towards death. When you, when you find that life is short, when you find that this may be your only chance in life to be the best or the only person you can be, that can be overwhelmingly scary and keep you in place and keep you doing the things that you want to do in a minimum way, keep you from being unhappy, keep you from having no hope or you can find out that if you are appreciative, if you like what you have, then everything new that's added is, a, is an extra added gift. I hear this a lot with very successful people who, who feel like they had a little bit of luck in their lives. And they say, oh, it is hard work, but, you know, there is luck. And I appreciate all the gifts I've been given. Love those people. Humble and appreciate and know that fate and destiny sometimes work out for you. And sometimes they're... It's a little more of a struggle, but you could still have the life you want to live inside this life. Focusing on the present can help you to build hope. High hope people see and respond to the world differently. They use their thoughts to focus on what they can control. That's the statement he made. What can I do to make my life better? How can I personally make myself healthier how can I build new habits into my life so I don't feel so much despair? We're not avoiding despair. We're, we're feeling less of it. We're dealing with it. Depression puts you in a cycle where you focus on the problem. The problem, I feel so bad. I can't remember anything. My body hurts. I can't get up off the couch. I need to go drink a lot. I need to shut this off because it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. Uh, hopeful people, when they have despair, they go, what? What did I lose? What are the things that were good about that? What are the things that had added to my life? How do I process this loss? How do I get through this? Not avoid it, but get through this. You know, how do I overcome? How do I find a way out? How do I come through this? Um, the famous famous psychologist who developed logotherapy, Viktor Frankl, wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he said there's three main points of existence. Love, suffering, and essential existence. But when, he's, when he writes about suffering, and suffering, quite often we don't see that it's a chance for us to reach our potential, to endure, to find, to discover, 
what this can get us to, how it can make us stronger. Nietzsche's famous saying, I, I don't even know if it's right or not, but it, it doesn't, I, it, it says that which does not kill us only makes us stronger. Biologically, you know, certain things get built up when they get torn apart, you know, but it doesn't always feel that way. Sometimes it just feels like, man, I keep getting pushed down and beat up the same way over and over again. But if you're always looking at the bad stuff and not taking a break and saying, hey, I need a vacation. I'm going to start looking at solutions versus just problems. It becomes more uh, easy to deal with. What can I control? I'm having financial problems. What can I do? Do I see a lawyer? Do I talk about credit consul consolidation? Do I pay my bills on time? Do I just make more money? Do I file for bankruptcy and move past it? I don't know. But when you focus on the present and see what you can do for today, today I can do this much and I can't do any more, I think things get better for most people. Be self-reflected and confident. While believing in oneself is important, highly hopeful people are able to forgive themselves as well. This is incredibly important. Forgiving others and forgiving yourselves is, is probably the very, very essence of learning how to let go of things. We don't often tag them together, but forgiveness, when you have a deep, deep-seated trauma, deep-seated emotion, you have to be able to forgive something let, to let go of it. If you say to yourself, I'm, if I forgive, I, I, I give them a break, I let them off the hook. I, no, it's you that are on the hook. You feel this intensity. You feel this pain, this, this thing. You've got to see how much is it costing you. How long have you held it? And then when you're ready, you know, you can learn from past things. You can find the lesson in deep suffering. Even if it's somebody who hurts you, even if it's loss, even if it's grief, even if it's trauma, even if it's assault, even if it's sexual assault, it won't happen overnight. But over time, if you get help, you can find ways to forgive, let go, move past. And when you're able to do that, a giant weight lifts on your heart. It's incredible. We carry so much emotional stuff. I always use the metaphor, like it's like rocks. Uh, Albert Camus wrote a great, great, great existential piece called The Myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus was condemned to roll a boulder up a hill for eternity. He would roll it to the top of the hill and then he would let it roll down, and then he would be somehow directed down there because the gods had control over him. He had no control over his life. Camus theorized that the only time Sisyphus could enjoy anything was at the moment he let the rock go down the hill and his walk down the hill. His whole existence was that walk. He had seconds, not a lifetime, to enjoy things, to see and smell the air, to feel the wind on his face, to drink water, to eat fruit, to enjoy things. That struck me. His point was that in our lives, we have a short period of time. Our existence is fragile, but our potential is as big as we want it to be. Our potential is big as we were meant to be as humans. We don't know what our potential is if we never try to aim and shoot for that potential. Being confident and self-reflective allows us to open up space to do that. And then finally, it says, have a positive outlook. Keep hope alive through these practices. Find hope in others. That's another way to look at it. Be grateful for life. Another thing is to take some of these over-incredible expectations, sorry, we all have them, of something that you deserve or entitled to and revisit them all the time. You know, sometimes I get uppity because I think I'm smart sometimes and somebody's, <laughs> I know it's funny, isn't it? I, I get delusional and sometimes I'm like, man, I'm smart. 
I'm smart as these guys. And then a smart, <laughs> and then a smart guy will come and just like, wow. And I go. You talk to Rick and then you, <laughs> and then you talk to Rick and you go, okay. <laughs> Rick isn't down like that. Rick is smart, and he doesn't know how smart he is. It's really funny. I know, right? You talk to Rick, and you're like, what? I got to read about 22 more books. And then, He's like, no, don't worry about that. I'll tell, him, tell you about them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and he's a guy who was scheduled the time to do it and talk about it. And Rick just loves the discussion. I mean, he's so into the community and discussion. He loves it. I mean, he'll even talk about stuff he doesn't really believe in or think about. Because he just loves the communication aspect of it, and he's really good at it. He's just a great, communi- great, great, great person. Sorry, that's Dr. Rick Chambers has been on the show. He's a fantastic. He's one of those positive people. There you go. That you just can't help. Like when you get when you leave him, you're just kind of like, okay, the world's gonna be better because there's people like Rick walking around. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Lord. He's a wrestling fan. <laughs> that's right. Can't help but add on the wrestling, right? Wrestling provides hope to others in a in a big way. But um, keeping a positive outlook is is a number one thing to try and do, even in hard times. I've I've been in places in my life where I felt like, man, what is the point of all this? Who's a rabble? And I got all these tools and books. Like I have like. 12 bookshelves full of books. You know what I mean? I got books of mom, I got books, blah, 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 blah. all stuff about psychology, how to fix stuff, diagnose it, blah, blah, blah. You just can't apply stuff to yourself. So you got to have an outside perspective. You got to have people outside going, hey, man. When I was writing my dissertation, I got really sick and I was like checked out. I submitted a copy of my uh, dissertation and the writing was so terrible, my chairperson actually got three other people to come to my house and visit me and go, hey, what is going on? And I'm like, what do you mean? That was a great, great. And she's like, well, well I'm going to read it out loud to you. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. What was going on in my brain is like different than what came out on the paper, okay? Um, and she said, you know what? You just need to stop because you're sick right now. And you need to take care of yourself. And this other thing, we'll get it done. You're not going to not do it. And she was right. But it was those people who came who were all like, man, we think your project's really good. My first dissertation chair told me she thought it was important paper, something that was going to change the way we do this particular way, this particular qualitative research thing, because I was actually inventing a whole new method. But it, it just didn't come out that way. I just, but the thing is, is in academia, a finished dissertation means you get to graduate. So that was my goal. Take it easy. Don't try to do something beyond what you can do right now. Take care of yourself and then get the job done. I got that done by some positive friends who came over and reminded me of how far I'd come. And that I'm so close to where I need to be. And I'm going to end it right there and just remember, you know, cultivating hope is going to help you have a better life. It's going to make you feel better. And don't do it just out of a practice, but do it where you feel it. Feel it in your heart. If you can't find hope, then it's really time to get some help. And you can go and look on Psychology Today. You can look me up. I'm here in Georgia, lovely downtown Noonan, the city of Holmes, the headquarter of the most live radio station programming in the southeast. <laughs> mm-hmm. Live heartbeat. The live programming that we, we do this old school radio and um, Dr. Johnny Fever comes in once a week and Venus Flytrap has a visit to consult on our coaching and talent experts. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm glad you're here. I hope you have, I hope you hope and have a good life and enjoy what you have. Remember, if you increase your gratitude and lower your expectations, hope is a natural product. And I'm going to check out, and I will not be here next week because I will be in Savannah in the low country getting some crawfish and uh, gator tail and uh, hanging out with some good people at the uh, Licensed Professional Counselors Association where I'm going to be presenting on how to use technology to improve your supervision efforts in the clinical environment. That's a big old title, ain't it? Um, 
and I'll be back right after that. And we're going to do, when I come back, we're going to do music therapy. And I have got some really sad songs to play that are really sad. They were like these Irish ladies. Have you ever heard these like Irish folk singers sing these songs about lying on people's graves and stuff? Wow. It's really sad, but we're going to play some sad stuff and some new stuff I found. And this great band called Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but some tunes by that. And we'll see you next time here on 99.1 WQEE, the station where happiness finds a home. What's cooler than cool? Casper's new cooling mattress. Say hello to the snow, engineered to help you sleep five degrees cooler all night. Casper, for the love of sleep. Exclusions apply. See casper.com slash promo. At Casper, we love sleep as much as you do. That's why we're bringing back the very first bed in a box millions love at a price everyone will love. Meet the Casper, a mattress so comfortable it could only have one name. Enjoy four layers of cozy support for just $9.95. Plus, get Airscape technology to help you wake up refreshed. Get your best rest at our best price with the new Casper mattress. Shop online or visit a Casper sleep shop near you today. Casper, for the love of sleep. Exclusions apply. See casper.com promo.